So we're uh, talking with Greg Pallas, the uh, investigator extraordinaire. And uh, so we're going to be talking about your new book, uh, How Trump Stole 2020. But uh, I wanted, I was kind of always curious about uh, your background. So yes. <clears throat> I've known you for many years. But um, I was curious uh, because you actually studied uh, economics, right? So oh, yeah. curious, <laughs> like, how you got into uh, becoming an investigator? Uh, because it's follow the money. So my economic training put me way ahead of, of other investigative reporters. I didn't just get economics training. I got economics training from the ultra fascists. I was actually a protege of Milton Friedman and Art Laffer and um, George Stigler and uh, the, uh, the ultra right um, free market uh, Pinochet uh, Chicago boys crowd. So I really knew what these characters are up to, what the future and budding bloodied billionaires were out to do. And I used that information to go to work as an investigator for labor unions in Chicago, for um, uh, community and consumer groups, and ultimately for the attorneys general and justice departments where I got into heavy duty uh, racketeering and fraud cases. I brought down in New York, I brought the racketeering case, uh, uncovered the racketeering fraud by Long Island Lighting Company and closed the Charm nuclear plant with a $4 billion um, lawsuit which we won. And uh, I was the chief investigator on the Exxon Valdez breakup uh, for the people that owned the Alaskan shoreline, that is the uh, Chugach natives. So I've been doing, in, you know, investigations. I've gone undercover. I go, you know, disguises. You know, I have these very uh, elaborate teams and we use a lot of uh, my economic information from using computers, et cetera. So when I go after vote busters, I always follow the money. And being an economist by training, uh, I have a good sense of uh, the smell of the green. All so right. when I first met you, it was like uh, shortly after the WTO. And- uh, uh, The Battle of Seattle, 1999, yes. Yeah, and uh, you were doing investigations for the BBC. Yes, and, the BBC uh, and the Guardian. Uh, yeah, so you know, I asked you. I, I said that you should be on American TV, right? <laughs> you know, but uh, the thing is, um, you know, I was curious about how uh, it, you know, uh, you realized that you weren't going to be able to do this kind of reporting on American television. And I think uh, when they said, "Get the hell out of here, Palast," we don't we don't do investigative reporting in America. We do re we don't report anymore. We repeat. That's, yeah. you know, we got repeaters, not reporters. They go to press conferences, you know, and, uh, or, or they talk about the, the Twidiot and Chief's latest, you know, uh, yeah, bleach your uh, behind with oxychlorodone and Clorox and you're fine. Um, all right, but I realized right away, I mean, I was working, you know, people always say, you're ignored by the mainstream. No, I'm not. America ignores the mainstream. The Guardian newspapers are the number one papers in the English language. And that's where I broke the story about how George Bush stole the election from Al Gore. That was 20 years ago. We're still here. Yeah. You know, talking about that stuff. So it was in The Guardian, not in a U.S. paper, that I broke the story that Catherine Harris in Florida had removed tens of thousands of black people from the voter rolls, calling them felons. Their only crime was voting while black. That's how George Bush stole that presidency. So why am I back after 20 years writing a, a book called How Trump Stole 2020? Because right. not only are we not, so I've been locked off, locked out of a lot of the mainstream, so-called, except again, I was BBC television, the, the big nightly news show, an investigator for them. That is, BBC is the gold standard of the mainstream. It's only in America that the, like National Petroleum Radio is not too excited about having me on. But that's, but look, because I'm talking about something that's really uncomfortable. That American democracy ain't, it's a good imitation of democracy, but it ain't there yet. Yeah. And that we still have apartheid elections. And that's why I wrote this book, because I mean, the whole point of how, here, see, how Trump stole 2020 is that you can steal it back. That is, we can bust the burglary. I don't want people to think this is a prediction. I don't have a crystal ball, okay? I don't have two crystal balls, but I uh, definitely don't have one. And um, 
And so I'm not saying this is what's going to happen. I'm saying they've literally stolen the election already. And as I explained in the book, they began stealing it in 2018. That's when Trump stole the election. The way he did it was by removing literally hundreds of thousands and millions of voters from the voter rolls. Did you know, Ed, if you read the book, I'm going to test you on this, that 16.7 million American citizens were removed from the voter rolls in the last two years. That's almost 17 million people. You may be one of them. By the way, if you're watching after this or while you're watching this, check your registration online. I know you think, oh, I want to vote in the same place 30 years. So what? Wake up. Understand what they're doing. (laughs) Understand what they're doing to you. Okay, they're stealing, they're taking your vote with both hands. Now look, if, if you read um, How Trump Stole 2020, you'll meet Christine Jordan, 92 years old. She, I was at the voting station in Atlanta with her when she was thrown out. She'd been voting at the same voting station for 50 years. Since 1968, the year her cousin was murdered. That's her cousin was Martin Luther King Jr. And after his sermons, he'd stay at her house. 50 years of voting since her cousin was murdered in 68. And they threw her out because they said she's no longer registered. And her niece is hysterical, saying they have no explanation. Her name's on the voter rolls. And Okay, so check your, don't be Christine Jordan. It's horrible. But there were, and let me tell you something. In Georgia, for example, Stacey Abrams, the first black woman to ever run for um, a governorship in the United States. I mean, any state, not just Georgia, like New York. We've never had a black woman run for governor anywhere, believe it or not. And before the election, she was running against this character named Brian Kemp. You'll meet him in my book. He's a guy that with the ads where he has a shotgun and he has, says he has a pickup truck to round up illegal aliens himself. And he talks like that because he's made up this accent just to fool the rubes in Georgia. He actually never had that dog patch accent. That's a fake, like everything else about him. And he removed, he removed 340,134 Georgia voters illegally. And we find out, he said that they'd moved out of the state. Well, hey, listen, if you left Georgia, I don't think you should vote in Georgia, but they didn't move. Christine Jordan's been in the same house for 50 years. Over a third of a million people, we got the experts. You know, look, who knows where you live? Who knows what you did last Thursday? What porn you ordered, Ed? We know. It's Amazon who knows. I hired the experts from Amazon. These 240 databases, including where you just got your Chinese food delivered, uh, where you had your Amazon package delivered, your, your phone bill, your electric bill, your tax bill, to 240 databases to determine where you live. And we, just, and we found out that they were lying. They were simply saying, well, black lady, you're out. That's how Brian Kemp became governor. But more important, that's how he's reelecting Donald Trump because the methods that they took for a test drive in Georgia are what they're using in Ohio, in Michigan, in Georgia, in Alabama, in North Carolina, and in Arizona, in these swing states where we're seeing millions of people flushed out. That's how Trump already stole 2020 but we can steal it back. Start out with your own vote. Check with your Secretary of State, see if you're registered. At the back of the book, at the back of How Trump Stole 2020, there's a two-pager that says, it's, it's my ballot condom for safe voting, you know, so you don't lose your vote. Um, and one of the num- uh, number one is check your registration right now, always. Yeah. So, uh, Stacey Abrams is the only one the only Democrat that has ever uh, complained about the vote being stolen from her, you know? So I asked you a long time ago, we were riding around in a car, you know, if Republicans are stealing uh, all these elections, why don't the Democrats expose it? And you said, because the Democrats do it too. And yeah, later I, I... you said, you know, the uh, Democrats steal the primaries and the Republicans steal the general. And yes. Uh, so at any rate, but uh, Stacey Abrams wasn't going to stand for it. And, and so, she, you know, she raised hell. So there's two questions, you know. Mm-hmm. Why doesn't the American media 
touch this subject because I know that back in 2000, you tried to give this to CBS and uh, they called the governor of Florida uh, and they said, oh, there's nothing to it, right? But yeah, then well, Democrats <laughs> don't expose it either, except for Stacey, Stacey Abrams. You know? Well, we have two things here. One is the Democratic Party. I have a chapter called Silence of the Democratic Lambs. And you see, yeah, everyone's asking me, so where's the Democrats? After all, if you remove black voters and brown voters and Asian American voters, it's Democratic voters, right? Voters of color. The color's blue. Where's the Democrats? Because they're up to their neck in, in the games. And also, be honest. If you let everyone vote of every color and every age, you'd have a very different Democratic Party, a very different Democratic Party, right? You'd have a different president too, by the way. Um, and so what's happened is, is that states, so yes, yeah, so you, I forget, and then I have a chapter in the book called California Riemann, and it's about how the Democratic Party in this last primary, by the way, that's how fresh this book is. It went right from my laptop right to the printer. So I still have the March primary. I'm telling you, go through the numbers. Bernie Sanders was shafted out of 553,000 votes in California. 553,000 votes in California. California has more uncounted and disqualified ballots than any other state in the nation by far. Yeah, Georgia's a, Georgia's a, a Jim Crow hellhole. Ain't as bad as California. How about that? And <laughs> so, yeah, so where are the Democrats? They're, they're you know, they're driving the getaway car. The, uh, but yeah, it's, all, it's always a problem. The other is, um, and I, you can't say Democrats don't complain. Like you said, Dem you have Stacey Abrams, but she is African-American. Um, I get a lot of support from the Congressional Black Caucus. My problem is, where is the support from the Congressional White Caucus? You know, um, <laughs> so th this is the problem. Um, and, and you're right. Yeah. Back in the 2000, uh, I ran the story at the top of the BBC nightly news about how the election was stolen in Florida. And so Dan Rather of CBS news wanted to pick it up. So what he does is he calls, he calls Jeb Bush's office and says, Greg Palace says that you remove these voters illegally. I said, that doesn't, no, it's not true. So CBS called me up and said, well, your story doesn't hold up. I said, Oh, really? Okay, I'm not, you know, I'm a reporter. I'm not the Pope. I'm not infallible. So, okay, tell me why, what's wrong? And they said, well, we called the governor's office and they said it wasn't true. I said, oh, I didn't think of that. I, you know, here I did all this investigative reporting. I got the inside files from inside the computers of the state of, of Florida. I've got the names and addresses. And here is, here's the, by the way, right here is Willie Steen, a guy who lost his vote illegally, a young black man, never had a parking ticket, was called a felon, lost his right to vote. But hey, I should use CBS methods and just call the perps. But you'll see in the book, I do go after, I do ask the perps why they did it. But yeah. then I don't bury the story if they say that they're not guilty. You'll see, I have shots in there where I'm jumping Stacey Abrams' opponent, Brian Kemp, under a pig. That's where I found him. He kept ducking me. So... I fly down to Georgia and I can't say it was a difficult investigation because the guy is driving around in a big bus that has Kemp in five foot letters on it. So I followed, I followed the, the Kemp mobile to a pig roast uh, and, uh, and I uh, jumped the, uh, the secretary of state, the uh, porker in chief, uh, the Persian general of Georgia stealing the votes and asked him if he was, removing black voters just so he could win the election. I didn't get a very good answer. So what can I tell you? But the interview so-called is in the book. Yeah. So uh, the thing is, okay, you exposed all that stuff about California mm -hmm. and exposed it last time. And I had a uh, roommate uh, that, <laughs> whose son was in Brooklyn last time. Ah. He's actually a lawyer, right? And uh, so him and all his friends went down to vote for Bernie and uh, they were magically disappeared off the voting rolls. So I know what you're talking about is absolutely true. Well, that was in 2016. Yes, actually, I can tell you it was 125,000 voters magically disappeared in Brooklyn and illegally. By the way, those voters were returned to the voter rolls after a suit by the New York Public Interest Group. And... Um, 
but after the election. See, that's the problem with vote thievery. The thieves steal the police, the voting police, right? So it's too late. Yeah, so you could sue after the election. So, but look, don't despair. Okay, this is important. I mean, if you look in how Trump stole 2020, you'll see that there is um, that basically Trump blocked. Oh, I say Trump. He's he doesn't have the native brain cells to do this, but but his minions blocked 7.9 million voters and votes from being cast in the 2016 election. That's how Trump stole 2016. You can't understand the theft of 2020 without understanding the theft of 2016 because people are shocked, shocked. Oh my God, how could Trump have won? In fact, it's funny. I got a call from Bobby Kennedy. He just, he uh, said, you know, Greg, he called me in the middle of the night. He said, I left New York and Hillary Clinton was president. I arrive in Los Angeles and it's Agent Orange. <laughs> what happened? I said, Bobby, don't you read our own articles? Because he and I are writing for Rolling Stone, as you'll see in, in the book. I said, don't you read our own articles? He stole it. He stole it. And the way that they steal it is by removing the voters. There's, look, there's just not enough white guys to elect a Donald Trump. So you get rid of the non-white guys and you got yourself a Trump presidency, for second term, third and fourth term too. So we're talking Discount about that. both Democrats <laughs> and the Republicans. And uh, one of the things I wanted to, uh, dig deeper on is that okay so uh, you were talking about just recently you were exposing this primary we're still in right and what happened to burning in california but you know i was reading <laughs> you know what the press was saying is that uh you know bernie's uh young people just didn't turn out right and uh, that just sounded so fishy you know, because it's not just black and brown people that they eliminate from the voting rolls. It's young people, too. And and so, uh, you know, that's actually, you know, after you wrote the book. So uh, maybe you can, if, if there is something that uh, you know, like what no, happened before, after I, California. No, I was still writing the book. Um, and yeah. uh, like I say, it's very fresh. And so it, what they don't get is here's what happened in California. You have Alex Padilla, who's working on the Biden campaign, and he's running the election, just like Brian Kemp ran the Georgia governorship campaign while he's running. Padilla's running the Biden campaign while running the presidential primary. And one trick he's pulled is that 4.2 million people in California are independent voters, or what they call NPP, no party preference voters. By the way, if you're no party preference voters, don't bother voting. They're not going to count your ballots, okay? This is, this is the trick. They have the legal right to vote in the Democratic primary, but guess what? Alex Padilla sent out over three and a half million ballots without the presidential candidates on them to the independent voters because independent voters don't realize they don't get the presidential candidates if they are not in a presidential party, okay? So you can get your ballot by taking your independent ballot and asking for a Democratic Party crossover ballot. If you don't use the magic word crossover, you're out of luck. You don't get no ballot. Okay, you'd have to know the word crossover. Now, if you get that ballot, but most people get the ballot without the presidential candidates and have no idea, according to um, the, the top statisticians in California, they have no idea that they can turn this ballot in and get, uh, and get another ballot with Bernie Sanders and Biden, Clinton, whatever. You can get the presidential candidates. So it's a brilliant game played by Democrats to knock out Democrats. And the number one group of Democrats that gets screwed there are the Hispanic Democrats who were for T.O. Bernie completely. They got completely shafted. Uh, they get nice cards saying, would you, would you like a different presidential ballot in English? Thanks. Um, and by the way, that gets into our mail. <laughs> Mail and voting issues too, which are pretty dangerous uh, waters. So, you know, what, um, yeah. So the Democrats hand. screw other Democrats, whereas the Republicans screw young Democrats and and voters of color. Democrats screw young Democrats and voters of color. So they go after the same crowd. That's the problem. Yeah. The two parties gang up on the same voters. Right, and you know each state is different. You know, so the scam that they yes. they pulled in California is different than the scam they pull in Georgia. You know, but right. And again, that, yeah. Now the Republican so states, fishy. yeah, the Republican states tend to, to share their, their little evil toolbox. You have a couple guys, like you'll see in my book, Chris Kobach of Kansas. And if you can't remember his name, just think KKK. 
Chris Kobach of Kansas is running for Senate as we speak right now. He was Secretary of State. He created a system called interstate cross check, something I busted for Rolling Stone. I got inside and I got their inside files to look at the names. They're saying millions, 7.2 million people were registered in two states and voting, and they could vote twice. Seven million double voters in America, believe it or not. Well, I didn't believe it, but I was, all these reporters, I'm not talking just about the foxhole. I'm talking about NBC and Blind Witness News and all the rest of these characters. None of them asked for the list of double voters. They all ran stories about this wonderful new system that would match voter rolls and make sure no one could vote twice. Well, number one, people don't vote twice, Ed. They don't. We've had four cases in the past decade of a couple billion votes cast in America. What, we have four cases of double voting? And usually it's, it's someone who's kind of just screwed up and made an error. Now, but so seven million, but who are they? Well, okay, I got the list inside. I got Brian Kemp's list and Chris Kobach's list. And uh, there's a chapter in my book called James Brown voted 568 times. James Brown voted 568 times because there are 568 James Browns in Georgia that lost their vote because believe it or not, they found a James Brown in Detroit, in Motown, a James Brown in Baltimore, and a James Brown in, um, in Phoenix. But they had names like James Thomas Brown and James Albert Brown, but they said the same guy, James Brown, James Brown Jr., James Brown Sr. is supposed to be the same voter voting twice. But think James Brown, what color do you think James Brown is, okay? Here's the trick. Here's why this works. So it's just a list of common names. They're removing people with common names. They say, well, so what? The answer here is so what? 85 of the 100 most common names in the United States are minority names. Brown, Jackson, uh, Chung, Ho, Rodriguez. There are 832,000 Garcias. So Jose Garcia, as our experts were saying, you know, he's suspected of voting 29 times. These are the games that they're playing. They coordinate. The Democrats don't coordinate their little trickeries that they play. It's all state by state. But the Republicans actually have a national program. They had an organization called the National Association of Republican Secretaries of State, which is a little cabal of vote twisters who are more powerful than the Electoral College because they'll pick your president whether the voters have chosen that president or not. Right. So what you're talking about is cross-check. Yeah. And, you know, it's all based on this scam that people uh, are voting twice. Yeah. Which, as you pointed out, never happens. Why would someone risk a five-year prison sentence to yeah, vote Yeah, you go twice? to jail. And, and even yeah. Chris Kobach of Kansas is so easy to find. And he was given authority to go bust people who, who voted twice. He couldn't find. He found one Republican who had a vacation home in Colorado. And by the way, they can vote in that vacation home in Colorado in certain circumstances. So, I mean, it was a joke, but it's, a, it's not a joke when it f picks our president for us. And in 2016, interstate cross-check removed 1.1 million people, potential double voters. And you know how many of the 1.1 million people they arrested? How many? Zero. Out of 1.1, zero, zero. Yeah zero out of one, but 1 1.1 million people named Rodriguez and Jackson and Chung and Ho lost their votes. And by the way, that's the new group, which is under attack. When you talk about common names, Asian Americans, you know, this, because, you know, Asian Americans used to vote in the majority for Republicans, including the, the Muslim community in America was solid Republican, believe it or not. It's hard to remember that those days. Mm -hmm. And as they've changed, they've now become targets. So that if you have a name like Ho or Kim, David Kim, even if you just said Dr. David Kim, you would, you would knock out thousands of, of legal voters. And they did, they did in key states. And you don't think of you know big Asian American community in like a place like Georgia or Alabama, but, but this is the fastest growing demographic that there is. And they're getting shafted out of their votes. And it's sometimes it's violent. I have a chapter in, in um, Oh, there's the book again, How Trump Stole 2020. I have a chapter called Voting Gangnam Style because young Korean kids created a videotape called Voting Gangnam Style. 
and um, they had a group called 10,000 Koreans Vote to register 10,000 Koreans. And they registered they, their first 4,000. They sent them into the Secretary of State's office. And the Republican Secretary of State, our friend Brian Kemp, said, I didn't get these. Never put their names on the voter rolls. So the Korean leaders called, um, called up Brian Kemp's office to the Secretary of State, to the Republican Secretary of State, and said, where are our voters? We gave you 4,000 names. They said, oh, we never got these sheets. You're making it up. They said, no, no, we've made copies. We know because we made copies of these registration forms. They said, you made copies? And within a few minutes, the Georgia FBI, the Georgia Bureau of Investigation, were kicking in the doors of the organization 10,000 Koreans Vote. They literally kicked in the doors, took the computers, and threatened everyone with felony criminal charges for photocopying the registration forms. Why they copy the voter uh, registration forms? Because if they didn't, they would claim that they never existed and they would have all lost their vote. They, they, or they lost their vote anyway. They closed the organization. They intimidated the Asian American community out of continuing the registration drive. This is the ugly new games that are being played. Right, and uh, another one of the scams that, uh, is that uh, illegal, illegal aliens are coming in here and, and voting. Wait, wait, there's a spaceship. I hear the, I, the aliens are, are about to land. They're, wait, I'm getting a message from the mothership. Oh yeah, they're all the, the Hillary voters. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, the the aliens, if, by the way, if you look in my book, okay, I'm going to have to, I'll, we'll give you the picture. We'll, you'll put it up there. We actually do. Don't make fun of aliens voting. We actually have a picture of, in the book, How Trump Stole 2020, we actually have a photo of the aliens landing of the spaceship with the voters coming out and they all have um, their, their little voter cards and it all says Hillary on their sombreros that the aliens are wearing. So we have the photo. Of course, um, I suspect it was Photoshop, but you know. Yeah, yeah. so you don't think there, there are, no. So, so yeah, so they have the great illegal alien invasion, but it's no joke. I mean, I make fun of it with the spaceship because understand, if you're here illegally, the last thing you're gonna do is show up at a polling station, register with your name and address. You will go to prison for 10 years and then they'll deport you, right? So, no, it doesn't happen. People are not completely, in, I mean, there are com people who are completely insane, but they don't tend to vote. <laughs> they don't tend to register to vote and say, here I am. So it's insane, but it's also really damaging because in the state of Kansas, this guy KKK came up with a law which he also wrote which was passed in Alabama and another one in Arizona, which says you have to prove you're a citizen to vote. Now, I know a couple people out there are going to be saying, well, yeah, you should be a citizen to vote. And yes, you should. But how do you prove it? We're not red China. We don't have citizenship cards and we don't have little citizenships in our brains yet. Okay. So, the only proof is, we don't have proof of citizenship in America. Driver's license, social security. My alien wife does not have, uh, has a driver's license and social security number. That has nothing to do with citizenship. So the result is that thousands and thousands of people lose their vote, not because they're not citizens, but in, in Kansas, 36,000 mostly young people lost their vote because they couldn't find the only two things that, that count for citizenship, your passport, how many young people have that? How many homies, you know, uh, homeboys have their passports for international travel? And two is your original birth certificate. And if you're poor, a lot of people weren't even born in hospitals. I have actually in the book a, a photo of a woman who was accused of, um, she couldn't vote in Arizona because she didn't have the right ID. Um, and uh, she didn't have her birth certificate because she was 101 years old, Shirley Priest. And she said, when I grew up, we didn't have, I, we didn't have birth certificates. <laughs> and, um, but she was also, just so you know, that they said one of the reasons to require proof of citizenship is to stop Al-Qaeda from sneaking in and obviously voting. <laughs> you know how big they are in democracy. Um, <laughs> you, know, you know, it's like Al-Qaeda. <laughs> um, it's, uh, you know, <laughs> um, but anyway, <laughs> um, 
uh, we're laughing, but you know, as I did ask Shirley Priest, I had to, are you a terrorist? You know, because it was Keep Here for Voting, which she one of the terrorists that they're trying to stop. And she said, an heiress, because she can't hear very well. And her son, who's pretty old himself, he, she, she's 101, as her son said, Mom, a terrorist, you blow up buildings. So I have a lot of fun doing my work, except the result, though, is that we have a lot of people who've lost their vote for no damn reason, except that you have these scam artists who come up with cockamamie ways to remove mostly voters of color. And so all, all of these, these things, you know, they target certain populations that they know aren't going to vote for Republicans or corporate Democrats, right? So then, you know, a, a, a major part of this is young people, right? So if you have to show up, you know, with, an, with a, a valid ID, which they make sure that the ones that students have, they couldn't use, you know, uh, then you lose your vote. And you pointed out, rightly so, yep your book that this is this isn't just Jim Crow you know even Jim Crow it's not Jim Crow it's class warfare yes right? okay I, in fact you got it right v vote thievery is class war by other means it's really about economic power right so like you say they go after young people now, now in my book by the way I tell you some stories you never that most people haven't heard Two weeks before the election in 2016, when Donald Trump supposedly won Wisconsin by 10, 22,000 votes, that's it, out of 5 million cast. How did Donald Trump win Wisconsin? I mean, there's a lot of reasons you could throw in, like Hillary decided to blow it off and not show up in campaign. And, you know, when you are pro-NAFTA in a place that got destroyed by NAFTA, you're going to lose a couple votes, you might think. So Hillary was a hard sell. But come on. It's Wisconsin, it's Milwaukee, it's the University of Wisconsin. Two weeks before the election, they changed the voter ID laws, two weeks in 16. And they said, you have to have a, a state photo ID current to vote. Now, okay, the state gives out photo IDs to the University of Wisconsin students, but they made it so that the University of Wisconsin state photo ID does not count for voting. That's 182,000 University of Wisconsin students that were disenfranchised, boom, like that. That was the 22,000 vote victory for uh, Trump there. But even if you skip the students changing the ID laws two weeks before the election, yeah, you could use a license, but Ed, who doesn't have a license? People without cars, believe it or not. That means urban people, people who use public transportation. We know them as black people, okay? And um, so what happened was that according to the University of Wisconsin study that I put up in my book, over 50,000 black people lost their vote because of the new ID law and Trump wins by 22,000. So this is the games that are being played. It's brand new stuff. They're trying out brand new techniques that they've never used before. And it's a very dangerous thing. So you can't win with 51% of the vote. It's about 56%. They can't, and by the way, that's the good news that you need 56% of the voters to, to win an election. You might think, well, that's bad. It's not 51%, but there's, it's, you can, they can't steal all the votes all the time. Obama, when he was elected president, I showed Obama that he was cheated out of 5.9 million votes. And he told my co-writer, he said, yeah, he knew all about it. He actually could break it all down. He knew all my stuff, okay? But he just said, just overcome it. They can't steal all the votes all the time. You, you can overcome it. Yeah. And, but we have to know, look, if you wanna stock a, a pickpocket, two things. You wanna notice that their hand is in your pocket, if you can, or that they're running out the door with your wallet. If you don't, if you don't notice the crime, you're not gonna bust them. And that's why I wrote the book, to tell you about the crime so we can bust it and the voters can decide who our next president should be. It's not, I'm not even against Trump. You know, if he gets elected, okay, America, you made your choice, have fun, <laughs> go steady. Uh, but I'm gonna tell you, if that's the voter's choice, but it wasn't the voter's choice in 16. It's not the voter's choice in 20 so far. So we have to steal back this election. Right. And uh, one of the things which I didn't know that I found out from reading your book is that uh, largely because of you, 
uh, the cross check has been exposed and, uh, you know, states uh, supposedly aren't still using that, but they, they still are. Mm -hmm. Right. So you want to talk about that? Certain states are still using. Well, this is, here's the good news, bad news thing, you know, good news is that we actually busted interstate cross check. Chris Kobach of Kansas, Mr. KKK ran for governor. He stole his own election, by the way. That's one of the things he, he, another secretary of state who he's running against an incumbent Republican governor, Republican governor. And he, the Republican incumbent governor wins reelection. He beats Kobach. Kobach turns around and says, I'm disqualifying 500 of your votes. And so he disqualified 500 of his opponent's votes and declared himself the, the winner of the election. Uh, the, the, the good thing is not everyone is in love with vote theft, including some Republicans. They got pissed off and they and Kansas, of all places, elected a Democrat because Republicans were pissed off that their that their guy stole the election. They didn't mind when Kobach was going after uh, young black voters. But when they went after middle class white voters that they were very, very unhappy about that, they said, no, 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 no that, that's crossing. That's crossing a line. So. <laughs> you know, so even Kobach is in trouble. But when he lost his replacement, because Kobach was now radioactive in Kansas, said, I'm shutting down Crosscheck, because she knew it was just going to be a lawsuit magnet. And I was working with the ACLU on getting them to, to move on this and, and League of Women Voters and, um, you know, who are, who are uh, avidly uh, promoting my work. And... Um, so Kobach lost and Crosscheck has, has imploded. Now, some states are still using leftover lists that they got from Kobach in Kansas to knock off voters. That's ugly, that's horrible, that's terrible. But we did beat, we did beat the worst of the vicious purge systems. But now they've got new ones. They always got a new one back in the, in the, you know, in the, in the storage room, a new trick. So they've got new ways to remove voters. That's how they removed 17 million voters in the last two years. 17 million yeah and so they're kind of freaking out now because you know trump is kind of going down the tubes and he's probably going to take the republican party with him so they're, they're i don't doing, think so no 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 all the time. Mm -mm -mm -mm. you're looking at you're looking at polls yeah that tells you what voters want well voters didn't want trump in 2016 and i'm not just talking about the the popular vote that he lost I'm talking about the fact that in places like Michigan and Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, um, Ohio, Iowa, Florida, he didn't win those if you counted all the votes or let everyone who was blocked from voting vote. So I'd be very careful to say that, that Trump is in bad position. He was in terrible position. He was in worse position at this time. In June of 2016, Trump was in far worse condition than he is now. And the reason he's laughing is that he knows that they've got 8 million votes in the bucket before the race begins. They've got those millions of voters that they know that they could wipe out and the students who don't have the IDs. And like, for example, in Wisconsin, okay, it doesn't matter. I don't care if, if Trump loses by 11 million votes in California, which is conceivable. It's not gonna change the outcome of the election. What's gonna change is what happens in Michigan and Wisconsin and Wisconsin you have a right-wing group, an ultra-right-wing group backed by right-wing billionaires who are trying, who have sued to force the state to remove a quarter million voters. Now, remember, Trump won that state, shocked everyone by 22,000 votes. You remove a quarter million voters, that's 10 times his margin. And what they called inactive voters, people who've moved. They said they, they call it the movers list, people who've moved away. Now, I agree, Ed, that if you've moved out of Milwaukee, you shouldn't be voting in Milwaukee, but I got a hold of their list and I met some of these voters. They removed a black woman because their lists are filled with black women that they removed. They removed a black woman named Sequana Taylor. Sequana Taylor, they said, moved out of Milwaukee. That seems unlikely because Sequana Taylor is the supervisor of Milwaukee County. So I doubt if she left her county. But this is the kind of games that they're playing. And if the right wing wins, they're going to remove a quarter million voters illegally, mostly voters of color, from the voter rolls of Wisconsin. Then how do you win? 
same games are being played, even where there's Democratic governors like Michigan, where the state legislature has imposed rules which are wiping out voters everywhere. So I'm very, very concerned about Wisconsin and Michigan. And by the way, Georgia is a swing state. It is a white minority state, the first in the deep south. That should not be a red state. It's only because of the games that they're playing with the voter rolls and with counting the ballots. And we've got that same, these issues in a lot of swing states. And, and look out for states like New Hampshire, where there are real problems with the voting. Remember, they only have to steal a few votes in a few key states to steal the entire election. They don't care about California, New York, or Illinois. Yeah, so you were talking about the polling. Mm -hmm. So there's polls before the election and there's polls after the election. There's, um, you know, the exit polls. And yep. you know, of course that's the gold standard uh, internationally on whether elections have been stolen. But uh, that doesn't happen in the United States because when they started finding out that the voting uh, didn't match up to the exit polls, then the, uh, the media uh, started changing the exit polls. Can you talk about that a little bit? I mean, that's I a huge- I suspect you've problem. been reading my book, How <laughs> Trump Stole 20. Uh, yeah, um, yeah, in my book, I have a chapter called The Red Shift is Coming. The Red Shift is Coming. Um, it's so bad that we actually have this name for it among experts called redshift. Now, what does that mean? Exit polls, unlike opinion polls. In an opinion poll, you ask someone, who are you gonna vote for? You don't know if they're really gonna vote for that person. Even more, you don't know if that person's gonna vote. Remember, almost half of all Americans just don't vote, okay? So when you call someone on a phone, you don't know if they're gonna vote. You also, when you call on the phone, you don't know, you know who, what type of group you're picking. It has to be people who answer regular phone. Very few young people, for example. But, and the exit poll is different. Someone's just been there. So they know that they voted. They know who they voted for. You're not guessing. So the US State Department says that the exit polls are, as you say, the gold standard to determine if an election is honest. So the United States has rejected the elections in Serbia, in Peru, in the Ukraine, and elsewhere because the exit polls don't match the official count. So they say, well, obviously the official account is a fake. Now in America, the exit polls showed that Hillary Clinton had won Michigan, had won Pennsylvania, had won uh, Wisconsin, and some other states, I think it was Iowa, a couple of other states. The exit polls showed that she won those states that supposedly weirdly flipped to Donald Trump. By the US State Department's measure, the election was fraudulent and Hillary Clinton was elected. Trump lost. So by the State Department's own methods, we shouldn't be recognizing the US government right now. So again, does that mean that we can't win because there's because they play games? Yeah, they play games, they jack with the vote count too. Not, by the way, I'm not talking about like with uh, computers and some guy in a cave, Lex Luthor, you know, turns a dial and flips your vote from, uh, from Green Party to, uh, to Trump, to Orange Party or whatever he is. Um, no, this is about, we literally disqualify votes by the millions. Don't count votes by the millions, especially absentee ballots. 3.3 million absentee ballots in 2016 were, re were rejected or never cast, were lost. 3.3 million mail-in ballots. This year, it'll be 23 million lost. I'm not kidding. Yeah. So there's, all of this is illegal. <laughs> There's lots and lots of laws that have been passed, but for some reason they get away with it and, they, they, and Chris Kobach's not in jail, and he should be, but uh, that's very mysterious why that doesn't happen. But uh, I wanted to talk about vote by mail a little bit because, you know, Trump blurted it out, you know, uh, if, if everybody was able to vote by mail, Republicans would never get elected, right? But the thing about it is, is that I live in Washington and I vote by mail and mm -hmm. Oregon has a good system. And, uh, you know, so then, uh, you know, all these progressives are saying, you know, like, well, we'll just get everybody to vote by mail and they're going to have to do that anyway because of the cor coronavirus. But you're the only one that's saying it ain't necessarily so. So well, uh, here's, a, here's the deal. By mail. <laughs> what's wrong with vote by mail? They, they don't count the ballots. OK, that's OK. Here's. Here's the cold facts, okay? And by the way, people have been getting me wrong. 
I've been talking about the dangers of voting by mail, but it's a hell of a lot dangerous, more dangerous not to vote by mail. I mean, you shouldn't have to look at these gloves. You shouldn't have to die to vote. Okay. So we're going to have to mail in our ballots, but we're going to have to learn how to mail in our ballots so we don't lose our votes and let them steal it away from us. So number one, according to Emma, if you read in the book, I have a, 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 an insert called the emergency alert chapter for the virus votes for Trump. And uh, the, the issue here is that According to MIT and Caltech, which has studied this pretty carefully, 22% of all mail-in ballots never get counted. 22%, Ed, that's one in five ballots. And as they said, if in precinct voting resulted in, if you went into the precinct and we lost 4%, which is what we lose. He says, if we lost 22% of the vote, of the in precinct vote, if one in five people were told your vote won't count when you walk in, we go nuts. And yet MIT says, we don't seem to care that we lose a fifth of the mail-in ballots. Now, number one, how do you lose a mail-in ballot? Number one, number one, if you don't get a ma ballot mailed to you, you can't mail it back. I know that sounds pretty simple, but that's the biggest single problem. And if you are African-American, if you're on one of their purge lists, if you're one of their inactive lists, if you're on your cross-check list, if you're on one of these lists, they're not gonna send you the ballot. And then they hold it up for example, uh, and I, it's all in the book, but then I had uh, the, re, the Georgia primary just uh, a couple of weeks ago here. The, you had these giant long lines. Is it because you think that black people like to stay in long, spend four hours in the Georgia heat contracting a virus? No, they just don't want their vote to be stolen. Well, why are they staying there? Why didn't they mail in their ballot? Because they didn't get their ballots. The people who were, you saw standing those long lines were people who never got their ballots, but had asked for them, including, for example, one, Jerry Thomas. His wife asked for their ballots 45 days, a month and a half before the election, a month and a half. He got his ballot on June 10. The election was June 9. Now, do these people not, do you think, oh, maybe they screwed up, they don't understand the system. I'm sorry, Jerry Thomas is married to Andrea Young, who is executive director of the ACLU of Georgia. I mean, she's, you know, you're talking a top voting rights attorney. And yet her husband was shafted out of a vote. Mail-in ballots are really dangerous, but we're going to have to deal with it. You're going to have to learn how to get them and cast them. And yeah, you're living in, in the People's Republic of Washington. Washington, Oregon, they're not America. I'm not talking about Portlandian and, and, and uh, Seattle, you know, snowy white. Uh, um, I'm but talking about. I don't know if I if my vote counted, you know. Right. So and one I of the things sure is, yeah, across all the T's and write in my name exactly like it says on there and all that stuff. But even and, I don't yeah, know if my that's vote right. Counted. You've had a massive, massive, um, what's called residual vote in Oregon and Washington. Vote ballots cast not counted, and and it's very racial. Colorado just went to ma all mail in voting, like Washington but they didn't put in the same protections. The result was that the African-American vote fell off a cliff. African-American vote and white vote in Colorado were almost identical. And then as soon as they went to mail-in voting, black vote just went down to, uh, black vote dropped to 50% turnout, which was stunning. And I talked to an African-American voting rights attorney. In fact, actually the best voting rights attorney in the country, Barbara Arnwine. And as she says in my book, mail-in voting for the black community is gonna be a disaster because they, because you're talking about people that have that no experience with this mail-in voting and where they are moving about. So you have renters, low-income people, and this applies to students too. Low-income people move within a building. They move within a neighborhood. Students move couch to couch, dorm room to dorm room. How do they get their mail-in ballots? They're not forwarded. You're not going to get your mail-in ballot. This is the biggest problem. We have to work on making sure we get the ballots. Not to fill them out in your state. Yeah, it's postage paid. Not in places like Georgia. The, the it becomes like a poll tax and another thing to run around to get. And how many kids under 25 even know where to buy a stamp or what a stamp does? They don't even know you're supposed to lick the back. <laughs> yeah. And it's, you know, and, and so it's, there's all these things that happen with mail-in voting, which are difficult, but we can overcome them. We have to overcome them. We can, we shall. And I saw this in Wisconsin where they, you know, um, and again, where I talked about them, jacking with the people of Wisconsin in the primary there, we're there, and it's in the book. This, you know, this was only a couple months ago, the uh, Wisconsin primary. You had, 
you had a huge turnout by the African-American community, even though they dropped the number of voting stations in Milwaukee from 180 to five, 180 to five. Yeah. And so you had these giant lines again, because these are the people in line were saying to me and saying to us, we've applied for our mail in ballot, but we never got it. And so now they were stuck in this disaster in Milwaukee, but they overcame. The reason why the Republicans forced an election was that they needed to keep control of the Wisconsin State Supreme Court. And the, that was the only thing on the ballot. It wasn't the presidential primary, that was kind of over. It's the, it was the Supreme Court of Wisconsin. And the black voters came out and said, screw you. You think you're going to stop us from voting? We're going to risk our lives, but we're going to get, we're going to get rid of these schmucks. And they threw that right-wing judge right off the court. These guys were shocked. They said black people won't come out to vote. And they did. And that's what can happen in November. And again, it's not about whether I'm for or against Trump. It's a matter of letting the voters decide. And that's what we're going to work on. And if you read this book, you also get, like I say, you get your ballot condom at the backs for, for safe voting, you know, protect yourself and your loved ones. You know, you want to put this on your ballot so that you don't get any disease. Um, and it's specifically things like if you um, are going to mail in your ballot, um, make sure that you like include all the signatures. By the way, Milwaukee requires a witness. Alabama requires a notary uh, to notarize your envelope. Um, you know, it's not so easy in the rest of the country or the rest of the country. I, I'm so sick of people talking about the wonders of mail-in voting in Oregon and Washington because Portlandia is just not America. Right. And, uh, you know, like getting back to those uh, long lines in inner cities and stuff, um, how many people got the coronavirus? Be, uh, because of uh, in Wisconsin? Well, the last I heard was about 30, including at least two of the poll workers. You know, it's always hard to tell, but um, that was the last count I heard. And, and this is insane. This is insane. You don't risk people's lives, and especially poll workers are older. See, because what they're counting on is the fact that poll workers will not show up. That's what happened in Milwaukee. People just, they couldn't get the poll workers. So they went down to five stations because most poll workers are older people who are at risk, you know, all as old folks, folks. <laughs> and so, and so they just didn't have the, uh, the workers at the ballot. So we're going to have to vote by mail because there won't be polls open, literally, they won't be able to staff them. So you're going to have to vote by mail, but you got to keep checking. So, but you're not going to get your vote unless you check your registration, unless you read the damn book and learn all the ways they can steal your vote so you can protect yourself. You know, it's, it's, this is armor for your vote. This is going to protect you and your loved ones from a very nasty electoral disease, the uh, right. Trump demic. So the thing is, there's all of these ways, <laughs> you know, that they're stealing their votes, and it's different in all of the states. Yep. But there are all these solutions, and that, you know, I hate to recommend that people get your book, but you know, they should because. You, you got this one section in here, which is a cartoon section. You know, it's by right. Ted Raw. You're one of my favorite guys. And then you got this other section in here, uh, Protect Your Vote, uh, Ted and Greg's New Improved Ballot Condom, right? Yep. People <laughs> Safe voting. And send that out. And that that's really all you need. You know, if everybody read that, they would know how to protect their vote, right? Well, what they so, have to do is the reason to read the book, too, is to know how you can learn how to kind of protect your vote, but you have to know how they're stealing it. And you want to get that across to your to your pinhead cousin in Iowa who think Trump was actually elected by the electorate. OK, and the reason you got to straighten it out. Is that when we have unelected governments, we have things like police run wild. You can't gun. Look, you can't have police run nuts if the people in the community can do something about it through the ballot box. So if you have powerful ballots, you're going to get rid of the, of the bullets on the street. And this is one of the problems, out of control government. With George Bush, we ended up, we, he wasn't elected president, so we ended up with a war we didn't vote for. You know, same, you know, and, and once again, and by the way, vote thievery is an old, you know, is, is an old American trick. Hubert Humphrey actually won against Richard Nixon. It goes back to some of my writings investigating that election. 
we've had apartheid elections for a very, very long time. And, but we can overcome it. Again, they can't steal all the votes all the time. And in Wisconsin, the voters, despite every trick in the book, the, I, the crappy ID laws, shutting down the voting stations, threatening you with viruses if you show up to vote, failing to send you your mail-in ballot, uh, requiring uh, crazy uh, witness signatures on the mail-in ballot. Thousands were thrown out because they didn't have the witness signatures. And yet the public won. The GOP lost their judge. They it's thrown out on his keister. And again, it's not whether I'm for or against Democrats or Republicans. I'm for the voters choosing. So they try to block the voters and the voters got them. They got them in, in uh, Kansas. And Obama got them in 12 and 8 when they tried all these tricks. I think mean, they've gotten better at the tricks, but we can overcome the steal. And by the way, I, I'm glad you pointed out the comic book, which is inside the book, 48 pages by, by Ted Rall, because um, you know, if you're not read, into reading um, all the, the, the wonderful and glowing stories that we have here, fascinating stories, right, Ed? Yeah, there, <laughs> it, uh, section in but, there. But the comic book is worth, is worth the book. There is a great section in there, you know, about the history of vote theft, you know, just like you were talking about just now. It's, uh -huh. It goes all the way back to the beginning of the Republic. And, uh, you know, and so the- Yeah, in fact, uh, actually, I brought out in the book that, in fact, starts at the beginning, too, that we've, that there's nothing new under the sun. George Washington and Thomas Jefferson had a fight for Jews and Catholics to, for the right to vote. That was one of the very first battles. And that's what the we, the anti-establishment clause, clause of the Constitution, I, I won't use a long word like that again, I promise, um, but it's, it's the, it says that there should be no established religion. And why was that a fight? Why was that even a fight? It wasn't just to get rid of the Church of England, but you had like the state of Virginia required you to vote. You had to take an, an oath saying that you um, believed in the Lord Jesus Christ and you uh, had the, uh, and you uh, accepted no for the authority of no foreign power. Well, the Jesus Christ thing was to stop Jews from voting, but the foreign power thing was to stop anyone who accepted the Pope as a spiritual leader. Uh, so it blocked all the Catholics from voting. So that was the first battle. That was the first battle in the, in, um, of, of our Republic was uh, to let Jews and Catholics vote. And it continued on. I mean, uh, hey, American Natives, our indigenous population actually only got the right to vote in 1964, one year before the 1965 Voting Rights Act. And by the way, um, Jews and Catholics were not allowed to vote in, I believe it's Maryland, it's in the book, until three years after the Emancipation Proclamation. So black people in certain Southern states actually got the vote before, before Catholics. Yeah. So there's all kinds of ways, you know, and that this is very important, you know, the most important thing is, is the way, the ways to counteract this, right? That you list all in your book, and of course, they're all different in different states, you know, and uh, like, for instance, in California, how that they, you know, uh, eliminated all these votes for Bernie, right? Mm -hmm. was uh, because, because of the independent voters. So you're saying, well, you know, just break down and register as a Democrat, right? <laughs> just hold yeah, your well, nose. Well, if, if you want, look, I'm, I also have to say, if you're gonna pick a party's candidate, you might wanna be part of the party. Yeah. Um, and so one of the problems is, is that this idea that we have an open primary in California, the problem with it is a lie, okay? It's not true. You think you can vote in the Democratic Party, but good luck trying. So if you want to be a Democrat, if, I mean, it's up to you. I'm not telling you to be a Democrat, but you want to vote in the Democratic primary. The, the thing to do is register as a Democrat. You can do it right there. By the way, California, this is secret. California doesn't tell you that you can vote, register to vote on election day. We're same day registration state. No one knows this, you see no signs. But if you say, if they say, oh, you can't get a Democratic ballot or you can't get any ballot because you're not registered. Say, well, register me right now. You can do that in California. They just, it's a secret. But just tell them Greg sent you. Yeah. And so, you know, this leads me into like <laughs> what I get all the time, you know, uh -huh. from other, you know, so called progressives, you know, that they're so angry that the Democratic Party stole the primary from Bernie that they're just not going to vote, right? 
And, uh, you know, there's no way that they're going to vote for Biden or they're not, there was there, no way that they were going to vote for Hillary. And I say the same thing all the time that, you know, social progress does not come from elections, right? It's like Naomi Klein said, you vote for the one that's permeable to social movements, right? But Trump <laughs> is not permeable to any social movements, at least ours. You don't think. <laughs> so you do the best you can, then you get out in the street and you shut them down. You know, well, but that doesn't Yeah, mean I mean, so I think, um, look, I'm not going to tell you to vote for Biden or for vote for you know, uh, Agent Orange or whoever you want to vote for. But I will say this, I do want you to vote. And yeah, it's not, I'm sorry if the choice is, you know, is poison or cancer. Uh, that's, I'm, you know, what can I tell you? Okay. Uh, but I will say this, I have a chapter in there called Don't Steal Your Own Vote. Because I, we did have the problem that about 50,000 people, mostly students in Wisconsin, refused to vote because uh, Bernie wasn't on the ballot. That's according to the University of Wisconsin study. So in other words, Bernie or bus cost Wisconsin and probably the election. Now, I told you that the voter ID changes and all the other games that they played in Wisconsin were crucial to stealing Wisconsin, but it required that extra element of a few people saying, screw it, I don't care. You know, I'll just, <laughs> and um, um, so, you know, and I, under look, I'm sympathetic to the hashtag Bernie or bust. And I understood why people were angry and went with it because I, I was the reporter who busted the theft of the election against Sanders in 2016. But Bernie or bust, okay, guys, how's bust working for you? Yeah. So, uh, you know, uh, so th how do we get this word out? We get, you know, like, uh, you know, the mainstream media doesn't really cover this. And uh, so it's when I know that you've been on lots of shows on uh, free speech TV and everything. And this is uh, another reason why I wanted to do this show with you. But, uh, mm -hmm. you know, if, if people don't understand what's happening, you know, they're going to be able to pull off this uh, steal and we're going to be screwed because of, Trump gets the election, so it steals the election again, we're screwed, you know, um, you know, uh, we might be screwed already, you know, because well, it's, it, it's a question of, right, it, it's, fall, it's the money, okay, yeah. it's not about, okay, it's not about Trump and his personality, okay, he's the twittiest in chief, do you really care what he tweets at 4am? No, but we have to worry about is staying alive, okay, it's, it's, and the, policies are being run not by Trump. He doesn't have any, it, it, it's, he's a glove puppet, okay? And what you'll find in my books is some of the names of the people whose fingers are in the gloves. In other words, it's very important to follow the money. That is, all the policies that are being changed that we're not noticing. We talk about the virus and the fact that he wants to blame China and he wants to, you know, um, you know uh, drink chloride, uh, Clorox or whatever the hell. Okay, so we all, laugh at that or we are we're horrified by that but in the background you have the billionaires rewriting our laws i mean the Koch brothers and now david I'm is glad you mentioned that, by the way <laughs> it's in the book okay who's behind these guys like for example brian kemp who came up with this redneck scamp you know when i say redneck because he fakes he's a pretend redneck right who comes up with him well he is backed by Georgia Pacific because he's actually a timber uh, farmer. Um, and Georgia's the center of the pulp making industry. They make, that's your toilet paper comes from Georgia, okay? And not because Georgia has too many a-holes. It's because Georgia Pacific, the big toilet paper company is based there. Who is Georgia Pacific? Georgia Pacific is Coke Industries. You see this giant building in Atlanta. You say, that's a big building for a toilet paper company. Well, the answer is, the TP is just the cover story. <laughs> it's, it's, uh, it's the Cokes. So they own this guy because Stacey Abrams wanted to control land use, not have clear cutting all over Georgia. And Cokes couldn't handle that. Plus they, had, they want to drill offshore Coke oil and Stacey Abrams is against drilling offshore. So it's about following the money, following the billionaires. That's the problem is that we're not looking at, at, at what's happening. And it, you know things like when Trump ran, he said he was going to do something. He was going to actually take on the billionaires. And their favorite loophole, 
because it only is for billionaires in the finance industry is what's called carried interest. That's worth $170 billion to, the, um, to these billionaires. So um, what does Trump do? He's going to close that loophole. That was pretty damn bold. And I had a praising for that. And of course, as soon as he gets in, Steve Mnuchin, who's one of the people who, who uses that loophole, says, you're not closing that loophole. So they never close the loophole. So in other words, the billionaires, he's giving you this jive that he's, he's, the, he's the guy standing up to the big boys. Right. Now, the big boys have their fingers in his glove and they're moving his mouth. The, enough to distract you. And they're moving the fingers on his little uh, twitty at feet. Yeah. So, you know, I have relatives that are uh, evangelical, right wing. Uh, they're in this mega church cult thing. <laughs> you know, it's hard to engage them. You know, <laughs> you know, they're they're kind of like my lab rats. You know, <laughs> but you know, so, I won't go there. <laughs> yeah, there, there's there's a certain uh, number of people that are gonna be Trump's base no matter what, and you're not gonna be able to use reason to get through to them, you know, because, you know, God has appointed Trump to be, uh, you know, president to bring on the... Uh, could be. I haven't spoken to uh, the Lord in a few weeks, so I could be. <laughs> yeah, but, uh, you know, there, there's all these uh, other people, you know, they, they can turn, if we can get their vote to count, we can get them to turn out and we can win. But um, at any rate, uh, I think we're about to... We have got enough uh, stuff here to make a good show, and so I really appreciate. A couple it. more too, yeah. Okay. I think people definitely need to go to your website and you know sign up there so they can get updates and all of that stuff. You know, so you know, yep. we'll make sure to take care of that. Well, okay. Ed, you're the, you're the best. Three, two, one. This is Greg Palace, the author of How Trump Stole 2020, and you're watching Free Speech Television, television for the 99 percent. It's, so, yes, there are many of us aliens who vote. <laughs> <laughs>